Hey there, everyone. My name is Tristan. Welcome to the First Baptist Church of Gray, and thanks for spending part of your weekend with us. Before our service gets started, we'd like to take a few minutes to tell you about some things coming up for you and your family around FBC Gray. So, check this out. Go ahead, take out your phone, and pull up the calendar app right this minute and block out Saturday evening, October 23rd, for City Lights and Hallowed Nights. This year, it will be even bigger and better than ever. Instead of being on our campus, West Clinton Street will be closed from Zaxby's to the railroad tracks. Businesses will be open, food trucks, games, inflatables, bands, and lots of trunks for trunk or treating will all be ready for the thousands of people who will be here. And you know the drill, we need a ton of candy. Actually, we need half a ton. It takes just over a thousand pounds of candy to satisfy the sweet tooth of all of our trunk or treating munchkins. Yes, candy is expensive, but if you buy a little bit along, you'll never notice. Please start bringing candy now. Hannah has a collection box set up in the children's welcome area downstairs. If you have any questions, please see Hannah. We'll be observing baptism and communion next Sunday morning in both services. We have several folks who are following Jesus in baptism, but we know there are others who are waiting. Staff, all of our deacons, teachers and leaders, as well as the entire body of the church want to encourage you to follow Jesus and be baptized. Please see Pastor Randy, Pastor Austin, Hannah, Stephanie, or frankly, anyone for that matter. Let them know you want to follow Jesus and they will help you to know what to do. Jesus is calling. Are you ready to follow him? And hey, just a reminder of what FBC Gray has going on on Wednesday nights. Our fellowship meal is cooked by Deuce Black and his team from the Sawmill Restaurant, and it is always good. The meal starts at 5.15. Call the church office or reply on our Facebook page for reservations. And hey, your first time is free, so come try it out. At 6.30, we have Awana for kids, student worship for students, a men's class, a woman's class, and a mixed prayer meeting. Then at 7.30, we have choir practice. We'd love to see you and all the kiddos at FBC on Wednesday nights. Well, that wraps up things for this week. Our hope and prayer for you is that you find Jesus at First Baptist so you can give Jesus to your family, friends, and neighbors. Good morning, First Baptist. Hey, it's great to hear all the energy in the room this morning. That was that's wonderful, and, and the announcements are going on. So we're going to have a pop quiz now, and I'm going to, if you can give me three correct answers of what was announced, you get a $20 gift card. Austin's going to give it to you. Hannah, sit down. <laughs> Hannah always gets the gold star. Anyway, now nah, we had the announcements. You'll figure it out. We'll post it on Facebook, and you can hear them again. It's good to have you here this morning. We do have one little 911 thing going on downstairs. We got lots of babies and few arms. Uh, so Stephanie asked me to mention to you guys that we still need people to rock babies at 9.15 on Sunday mornings. And we work out a rotation. You do not have to change diapers. We have people that change the diapers. So you don't have to change any diapers. All you got to do is rock and get spit up on, and I think that's good enough. So if you guys would think about that, and if the Lord's leading you to serve, and I'm sure that he is, because he puts everything into the church that we need. Uh, please see Stephanie or Hannah, and they can hook you up. Just a couple of other things real quick. Uh, you saw the thing that said bring candy for city lights. Yes, but things have changed just a little bit, and just want to lay this out in front of you right quick. Uh, because of COVID situation, the, don't you love it when you lead with that? Because of COVID, because of the COVID situation, the the cities and the counties in our area have kind of started backing off on public events for the rest of the year. So what the city group is going to do with the Methodist Church is they're going to have a drive-through on the night of city, city lights. They're going to have sweet streets. It's going to happen in front of the Methodist Church where you can drive through for trunk or treat. But we got to thinking about that. And when you see how COVID scary we are today... Can't tell colors, right? Gold, purple, it's whatever. Um, and everybody's going to football games. So we're doing all this stuff we're doing. Guys, we're going to have something here on campus. We're going to do it on October the 31st, which is Halloween Day. We're going to do it from 4 to 6 o'clock. We're going to open it up to Jones County like we've done every year. We're going to call it the not-so-spooky Grayberry Spectacular. We got paid by the letter for that one. Uh, and it's all hands on deck. Where we are for Jones County. I've had so many people ask, 
are we going to do trunk or treat this year? We've got to do that this year. We need this. So we're going to. That's what we're going to do. But what it's going to take is First Baptist is going to take the role of just stepping out there and doing it. We're going to need 75 trunks out of this group. So if your family has four cars, might be a good time to have four cars out there. And if you need help decorating, I'm sure that we can find help decorating all that stuff, bring candy for it. We've got six and a half weeks to put this thing on, and we're going to do that. Everybody think that's a good idea? Good. I don't have to worry about getting voted out. The last thing I want to talk about is uh, D-Now, guys. We have 125 students been here over the weekend, and uh, what, what groups, Greenwood, Gray Methodist, and us, we had 125 students. You can see a big number of them are here this morning, uh, was at their worship service last night. Uh, Jordan Eccles and her band was leading the worship, and they were fantastic. Eric Reed, uh, Austin will introduce him in just a second. Eric gave the messages, and I was here for it last night. He was dynamite. The message was captivating. It was good stuff. So thank you all. You guys have been great. All the host homes have been great. Thank you all very, very much for that. Austin's going to introduce Eric and then lead us in prayer. Good morning, church family. How are y'all? Are y'all good? I can't hear you. Okay, very good. Um, so, no, we, our speaker over this weekend was, was Pastor Eric Reed from the Journey Church in Nashville, and he is fantastic, and he's going to be preaching this morning. So if you've got a Bible, use it. If you've got something to write down, write some stuff down. It, it's awesome. Um, we had a great weekend. Like Randy said, we had about... 120 students, probably 150 people all together in the chapel. Like, I actually had to sit on the floor for most of the sessions because uh, all the seats were filled. It was a great weekend. I do want to say thank you to all the volunteers, all the group leaders, everybody who prayed, everybody who helped this weekend. Y'all are champs. Y'all are the real MVPs. We love y'all. Thank y'all so much. We'll sign you up again next year. Um, <laughs> but I'm excited for worship this morning. So let's pray, and we'll go into a time of worship. Pray with me. Dear Lord, thank you for you. Thank you for who you are. Let us come here this morning seeking after your heart. Lord, let us hear a word from you. Be real in our lives. Let us take it from when we go from here. Lord, we ask these things in your name so that we know you hear us. Amen. Good morning, First Baptist. We are so excited to worship with you guys this morning. If you'll stand and sing with us, we're going to get started with House of the Lord. I expect to hear a lot from that side right there. We worship the God who was, we worship the God who is, we worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors, he parted the raging sea, my God, he holds the victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord, there's joy in the house of the Lord today won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We shout out your praise. We sing to the God who heals. We sing to the God who saves, we sing to the God who always makes a way. Cause he hung up on that cross, and he rose up from that grave. Cause he hung up on that cross, and he rose up from that grave. My God still rolling stones away. There's joy in the house of the Lord, there's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. Joy in the house of the Lord, our God is joy in this place, 
redeemed by His grace, let the house of the Lord sing praise. Cause we were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace.
I never do this. I never do this. Can we go back and sing that chorus one more time? Kim, if you'll start us, and then just everybody raise their voice. No music, just voices raised. Praise in the Father. to the beginning can't control what tomorrow will bring but I know here in the middle is a place where you promise to be I'm not enough Unless you come, will you meet me here again? Cause all I want is all you are. Will you meet me here
the Lord is in this place, not for a minute was I forsaken. The Lord is in this place, the Lord is in this place. Come, Holy Spirit, dry bones awaken. The Lord is in this place, the Lord is in this place. Good morning, First Baptist. How we doing? My, okay, that side is, is excited. Um, so my name is Eric Reed. Uh, I am a pastor in Nashville, Tennessee, at a church called The Journey Church. And I have a ministry, uh, a nonprofit ministry called Knowing Jesus Ministries. We just launched this ministry in August, so it's brand new, even though we've been working on it for like a year. And uh, the mission of Knowing Jesus Ministries is to proclaim timeless truths for everyday life, to proclaim the timeless truths of God's word for everyday life, for everyday people. And here's one of the convictions around why this ministry exists. Um, a few things. One, we believe that communion with God is not understood very well today. Um, no, not many people understand what it means to walk with God in relationship with God, to have fellowship with God, to know him. Not just to believe in God, not just to go to church, but to walk with God. And so we produce resources to help people with that. Um, we, we fight against inaccurate views of Jesus and shallow theology that's prominent in our culture today. And so we offer resources to teach theology. I've got videos uh, on the website uh, called Dumb It Down videos. That's my, pa my, my church calls me the Dumb It Down pastor. Um, I don't know if that's an affectionate term or what. It could be a, a, a knock. But um, the, the idea is that we want to make theology accessible understandable. We, we want to people to, to know the riches of God's word and understand it. Theology isn't just for the people who go to seminary. It should be for every Christian. The other issue we address is that Christians need to have some firm feet planted in our world today because the culture we live in is not patting us on the back for being Christians. In fact, they are fighting against what we believe are biblical views of the world biblical ethics and morality and so one of the resources we provide is just apologetics helps right how to stand firm how to know what the bible says about the issues we face in our culture today and how can we how can we stay the course how do we prevent conforming to the patterns of this world which is so predominant uh, you can go to our website um, kjmen.org um, and you'll find resources and articles on those topics. There's videos. Um, we also deal with the issue of the theology of suffering. And that's actually what we're going to talk about this morning. Is I don't think many Christians today, especially here in America, are very prepared for when troubles and trials come. Our faith isn't nurtured to the point of understanding what God is doing in the midst of pain and suffering, in the midst of trials. We act as if something strange has happened. When things don't go our way. And we begin to think either we didn't do something right or God didn't do something right. Because if we love the Lord, everything's supposed to just be smooth sailing for us. Everything's supposed to be easy, easy peasy for the Christian life. And so when we get rocked, we don't know what to do. 
And so one of the things that we do is we provide resources to help Christians develop a theology of suffering. And we actually have a respite weekend, a weekend where we minister to families who have lost children and help them to ground their faith in the Lord as they walk through that suffering. And the reason for that is because that's my family's story. Um, my 15-year-old son passed away December 1st, 2019. He was born with health issues from the very beginning. He had a bad kidney that needed to be removed. He had a good kidney that we were told he would live a normal, perfect life with that one kidney. And at two months after he was born, he was born premature. There were issues going on. They needed to have that surgery sooner than later. And when they did the surgery, they accidentally removed his good kidney along with his bad kidney. And so, as you can imagine, our lives were turned upside down in that moment. Now we're doing dialysis. Now we're on a transplant list. Now we're trying to just survive. And he did survive. He made it to two years old where he was big enough and finally uh, matched up to get a kidney. He received his kidney. And from that point on, from the time he was two years old to 13 years old, even though there was no stretch of the imagination to say his life was normal, it was more normal than our first two years. He grew up, he went to school, he played sports, um, he loved suffering with me, watching Tennessee football. Um, he, you know, he, he played online, you know, and gamed with his friends. He was a normal kid. Now, he had a lot of health issues going on. He had lung issues, he had... Uh, Medicine he had to take to keep his kidney transplant from rejecting, so it suppressed his immune system. So we stayed in and out of the hospital for weeks at a time every year. He would get infections that you and I, our bodies would fight off normally. Um, and so he, st he struggled with those things. But for us, that just became normal life. It just became normal life dealing with those issues. When he was 13 years old, um, he contracted something called fungal meningitis, and he had a stroke. He was unable to speak or use his motor skills anymore. His whole life was changed again. Our whole lives were changed again. And for the next two years, he would be in and out of rehab, trying to recover some of those things. He dealt with neurological pain that we couldn't ever solve and fix. And ultimately, his lungs couldn't stand under the pressure of the infections that he continued to get. And so on December 1st of 2019, my son Caleb passed away. And so his whole life, from the time we found out something was wrong in the womb, until the day he passed, until this very morning I'm standing before you, our family was thrown into trying to make sense of where is God in the middle of pain and hurt and hardship. How do you endure when the trials come your way? And so what I want to do this morning is I want to share with you some lessons that the Lord taught me early in this. Now, I have a book out there on the table uh, that we just released uh, a month ago called Uncommon Trust, Learning to Trust God When Life Doesn't Make Sense. It's a short book because I'm writing it for real people who actually read a short book. And, um, but it's not the content I'm talking about today. I'm, I'm talking about suffering today. I'm talking about theology today, uh, but it's different. And I'm saying all this to say this. Um, I give my money and I give my time to this ministry. I don't get paid anything from this ministry. This is my passion because I want to help people. I'm tired of seeing people fall away from the faith or get angry at God because life doesn't go their way and they have no categories for making sense of where is God in this. It breaks my heart when people who are walking through life all of a sudden get into to trials and afflictions and suffering and they don't know what to do. They weren't expecting it. They have no categories for making sense of any of these things. I'm tired of seeing that happen. I'm tired of seeing Christians suffer under wrong expectations because we don't have a biblical theology of suffering. So what we're gonna talk about this morning is a biblical theology of suffering. If you would, go to the book of Daniel and go to chapter one. Daniel chapter 1, you may be familiar with the book of Daniel. When the Lord began to teach me these lessons, I was not familiar with the book of Daniel that much. I wasn't a pastor. I, I was just a young 24-year-old boy who was married, who had a child laying in a hospital bed, 
and we didn't know whether or not he would survive the next moment. And I opened my Bible looking for help, looking for God to speak. And I didn't know where to turn. I didn't know what to read. And as I spent time walking through the Bible, I came upon the story found in Daniel. Daniel chapter 1. Let's look at verses 1 through 7 to begin with together. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. Then the king commanded Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of the nobility, youth without blemish, of good appearance and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace and to teach them the literature and the language, the Chaldeans. The king assigned them a daily portion of the food that the king ate and of the wine that he drank. They were to be educated for three years. And at the end of that time, they were to stand before the king. Among these were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah of the tribe of Judah. And the chief of the eunuchs gave them names. Daniel he called Belshazzar. Hananiah he called Shadrach. Mishael he called Meshach. And Azariah he called Abednego. As you read this story, the very opening of this book, what you encounter here is life as these people knew it is turned upside down. God gives over Israel and King Jehoiakim to the Babylonians, to Nebuchadnezzar and his armies. These are people who would have known their history. They would have known their people's story. Their God is the one who rescued them from oppression in Egypt. Their God is the one who gave them victory over stronger armies, over more powerful nations. Their God is the one who protected them and sustained them even though they were the weaker. These People are living their lives probably assuming that's what's going to keep happening until we read here that Nebuchadnezzar sieges Jerusalem and the Lord gives it to him. Can you imagine what they're thinking, the people who live in Israel? Can you imagine what they're experiencing in that moment? They're probably thinking just like all of history where God has spared us, protected us, kept us safe, God's given them over. Did they have categories for that? Did they, did they expect that to come? Were they ready for that? See, we can read this story and we can just kind of blow past that. We read it and we just keep on moving and we don't even stop to take inventory of what would that have felt like to be these young men, Daniel, Azariah, the age of these guys over here with all of their dreams, with all of their desires to have families, to maybe follow in their parents' footsteps in their trade or their craft, all of these people who thought life is going to go as it's always gone, and all of a sudden, it doesn't. All of a sudden, everything they know is turned upside down. Invaders have come. Their land is no longer their own. Their lives are no longer their own. These young people are shipped off to Babylon. They're stripped from their families. Their whole identities are changed. Their names are no longer their given names. Now they have Babylonian names. You and I can read this so comfortably, you know, in our, in our PJs and on our couches with a cup of coffee in hand and, and fail to catch how abrasive, abrupt, and disorienting that would have been. And yet some of you do 
to some degree, know what that feels like. If you've been thrown into the fires of suffering at any point in your life, you know what it feels like to have everything that you thought you knew get jerked out of your hands. When life is cruising along and all of a sudden it's turned upside down on you. When the things that you thought were always going to be this way are no longer that way. And it may be relationship issues. It could be health issues. It could be a loved one that you lost. It could be a job that you lose. It could be anything. It could be abuse that you've experienced. It could be disappointment and rejection from a friend. You go down the list. There are all kinds of trials and afflictions and suffering that can come our way that can make us feel as disoriented as Daniel 1 made them feel. And so as I read this as a young man, married for just over a year, having my first child and not knowing if he's going to live to see the next day, having a wife that couldn't even go into his hospital room, she was so distraught, and saying, God, what do I do? How, how am I supposed to see and understand what you're doing in this? What do I say to her? How do I keep my own heart that's breaking in two right now from just collapsing into despair. And I come across this story and immediately I could connect and resonate to how it must have felt to have your whole world turned upside down as they did. And so I continued to read and what I want to share with you this morning are five things that the Lord showed me at 24 years old that are still governing and guiding how I understand suffering. How we walked through not only my son's illness at that period before his transplant, not just through his life and not just through his death, but even still day by day, clinging to him in the midst of trials and sorrows and afflictions. And maybe the Lord would be pleased this morning to begin to show you how you're gonna live through the things that have come, are here, or will come in your life. Because they will come. Trials and tribulations will hit each of our front doors at some point. Some of you already know that. Some of you have already been in it. Some of you are in it. Some of you have been in it and are in it and will still have more. The question I have for you this morning is this. Do you have a theology of suffering that will allow for you to stand when it comes? I want you to look over at Daniel 3. As these young men are shipped away to Babylon, they begin to assimilate into the culture They're being taught the literature, they're being fed the food, even though they continue to keep their strict diet based on the law of God, they begin to assimilate into the world there. They're learning a new language. They're probably dressing as the Babylonians. They're they're doing life in Babylon at this point. But Nebuchadnezzar puts a decree out throughout the land and throughout his kingdom That whenever the sound of a certain tune played, everybody in the kingdom was to stop what they were doing, get on their knees and bow down in the direction of the statue. In other words, submit, demonstrate not only your submission to King Nebuchadnezzar, but your worship of him. And these young men, particularly Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, refused to do so. Even though their life has turned upside down, they're not saying, well, God forgot us, so we're not going to follow him. No, even though their lives have turned upside down, they are still walking faithfully. They're still obeying God. They're still seeking him. And word gets out that when the music plays, these Hebrew boys aren't doing it. And Nebuchadnezzar gets ear of this. Now, this is how significant this is. Nebuchadnezzar, at this point in time, is the most powerful man in the world. This isn't like, this isn't like some guy in the kingdom gets word of it. It goes all the way up the chain to the king himself, who hears that he's got people in his kingdom refusing 
to bow down to him. And so King Nebuchadnezzar summons them. And it says in verse 13 of chapter 3. Then Nebuchadnezzar in furious rage commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image I have set up? Now if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, the pipe, the lyre, the trigon, the harp, the bagpipe, and every kind of music, to fall down and worship the image that I have made, well and good. That's what I expect you to do, he says. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. So Nebuchadnezzar has these three boys brought to him. Now I want you to think about this. This is a man in power. This is a man of stature and authority and power. And these are three young men. And he says to them, is it true you're not bowing down? Is it true you're not taking the knee when you hear the music? He said, I'm going to give you one more chance. And if you bow down, well and good. You can go about your way. But if you don't, you see that fiery furnace? You see that furnace over there? You're, you're going in it. You're going in it. You feel the heat on your face? Imagine going in it. So I'm going to play the music and you bow down. Because if you don't, what God is going to save you? Nebuchadnezzar is exalting himself above God. He's prideful. He's haughty. He's arrogant. He, he thinks there is no one above his authority. What God's going to rescue them? What piddly little Hebrew God's going to rescue them from his powerful hand? And their answer back to him is the first point that I want you to hear this morning. They say to him, our God can deliver us. Here's the first thing that you need to have in your theology of suffering is our God can deliver us. We are not left to fate or to chance in this world. We are not serving a God who is up in the heavens, who is detached from his world. We are not serving a God who's simply observing and watching and flinching as he sees things happening. Our God is the God who is active in the world. You can't read the Bible and escape this fact. God is involved in his creation. God can heal. God can restore. God can mend. God is active. He can save. He can save the worst sinner. He can save and restore the most broken marriage. He can heal cancer. God can deliver. Friends, if you don't have this as a starting point in your theology of suffering, you will go into despair thinking that you're left on your own with the things that happen in this world. Now, our God can deliver. Our God is a God of power. With a word, with a word, he can do as he pleases. I don't know what things you're in or have gone through. I don't know what things you're fearful of about tomorrow. But if you're not walking through life as Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego are here, understanding that your God has the power to save. Here's the deal. If you don't believe that, you'll never cry out to him. See, some of us say we believe that intellectually, but we demonstrate we don't believe that when we fail to cry out to him in our sorrows and our pains. Practically, we live as if we don't believe he can deliver us. Friends, I can tell you, despite the fact that my son has passed away, that over and over and over again, he delivered us. 
we were given so many days that were undeserved, unwarranted, unmerited, unearned. Moments where it looked like we were going to lose Caleb at two months old, at two years old, and over the course of his life. And God graciously did what even doctors thought would never happen. Our God can deliver. And we must believe that. But now listen to what follows because this is usually the point where we struggle. Most of us don't struggle with the last point. In fact, that's what most of us are taught and it's the only point we cling to. God can save us, so we expect that that's what's gonna happen. Listen to what they say. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Did you catch those three words? But if not. Meshach and Shadrach and Abednego, at minimum, had a theology of suffering that said this. Our God can deliver us. He can. He's got the power, Nebuchadnezzar. You're nothing. You're nothing. Cancer is nothing. God is over everything. And he can save. He can deliver. He can heal. But if not, some translations say, but even if he doesn't, we won't bow down to you. We won't submit to you. We won't deny our God. Can I just challenge you to think about something for a moment? Do you have it in your theological understanding? Do you have it in your understanding of what it means to be a Christian in this world That God, having the power to save, may choose not to. God, having the power to heal, may choose not to. God, having the power to restore a broken relationship, may choose not to. Is it even in our categories for thinking like that? Or do we just kind of live thinking, no, we're owed it. We deserve it. He must give it. God's our little genie. We rub the, the lamp. He comes out. He's like, what can I do for you? They don't think that way at all. Here they are with the heat of a fire on their face. And they say this, our God can save us from your hand. But even if he doesn't, even if God decides to let us go in, we will be faithful to him. Even if God doesn't fix my circumstance, even if God doesn't change my health situation, even if my relationship doesn't turn a corner, God is God and I will follow him. I trust him. What do you do with that? I can tell you what it did to me. It stopped me in my tracks because I'd never heard anything of the sort. I'm looking at my son hooked up to all these tubes and all these monitors and his, his blood pressure is stroke level as a little two-year-old, as a little two-month-old with his kidneys just being removed. And I read, but if not, and I gotta be honest with you, I'm sitting there going, but why would you not want to though, God? If you got the power to, why don't you? If you could, Why is it that you might not? And friends, I wish I could give you some tidy, neat, little, bowed answer this morning. But here's what I know. The ways of God are far more mysterious than our ability to plumb the depths of. If God has the power to take away our trials, but he doesn't, And I know that God loves us and is for us because I know that from his word and I know that demonstrated at the cross where he gave his son for my sins. If he's got the power to take me from it, but he doesn't, then I'm left to assume he's doing something through it. 
He may be doing 10,000 things through it, and I may not be aware of any of them. I remember um, earlier this year, I was at an event speaking. My, my youngest daughter, I have two other children. Uh, Caleb was our oldest. Kaylee um, will be 12 next month, and then Kyra will be 8 the month after in November, so 11 and 7. And Kyra was with me on that trip. And Kyra is, um, well, let's just say it this way. She's the one that we're really saying, Jesus, you're going to have to do something really big here. Kyra's, Kyra's a savage. Kyra's, um, she's, she does her own thing. We thought we were really good parents, honestly, um, based on how Caleb and Kaylee behaved, how they listened, how they acted right in restaurants. You know, we were like, we should write a book on parenting because we're killing it. And then Kyra showed up, and we were like, nah, no books for us. We're terrible at this. Um, that's Kyra. So Kyra was with us, uh, with me on this trip, and uh, I was talking about Caleb's story to a group of people, and um, Kyra was crying. I saw her crying. And uh, it, it was hard. You know, she doesn't really remember her brother healthy. Uh, she was young when he had a stroke, and life changed for us. But she remembers him passing away. She knows he's not there. And as we're driving from the event, she said, Dad, why, why didn't God just fix this? And I said, honey, that's, that's a really good question. I said, but you know he's going to. You know, one day there will be no more tears. There will be no more sin. There will be no more hurting. One day we're going to see your brother again because of what Jesus has done. He'll be restored. We'll never, we'll never part ways again. And this is the question she asked me. She said, I know that, Dad. But why didn't God make it that way to start with? Why didn't God make it that way, the way it's gonna be, where there could never even be sin or suffering or loss or hurt? If, he, if it's gonna be that way, why not start it that way? She's seven. I'm like... You've been in theology school? Like, what are you doing asking this question? But this is what our little heart is wondering. If God is God, why this? It's a good question. And this is the only answer I could give her. I said, sweetheart, the only answer I can give you is that in creating a world like this, where pain and suffering and sorrows and loss happen, there's things about God that we learn that apart from those things, we would never know. There's things about his compassion. There's things about his mercy. There's things about his care. There's things about his provisions that we would never experience if we, if we didn't go through these things. In other words, there's, there's some way in which God gets more glory in the ultimate defeat of these things, in the ultimate Restor restoration of these things that without these things we wouldn't know or see or glorify him for I was like other than that I don't know I don't know but here's what I do know in this life God may choose but if not in your circumstances what you want to see happen may not go the way you want it to go The healing you're expecting, the restoration you're expecting may not come. But are you like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that says, but we'll still serve only him? Like Peter said, where else would we go, Lord? Where else can we turn to but to you? Now, let's continue because I got three more points and I don't got that much time, so... We'll be preaching to the second service comes. We don't want to do that. So Nebuchadnezzar's not thrilled about this, to say the least. These three teenage boys defying him. And so he flies off into a rage. And it says, filled with fury and the expression of his face changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it's usually heated. And he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to cast them into the burning fiery furnace. Then these men who were bound in their cloaks, their tunics, their hats, and their other garments, 
and they were thrown into the burning fiery furnace. Because the king's order was urgent and the furnace overheated, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the fiery furnace. So they're thrown in. Then Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste. And he declared to his counselors, did we not cast three men bound into the fire? They answered and said to the king, true, O king. And he answered and he said, but I see four men unbound walking in the midst of the fire and they, and they are not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Here's the third thing that you need to understand about a theology of suffering. God is in your fire. God is in your fire. God is in your trials. God is right near to you in your suffering, in your pain, in your mourning, in your sorrows. They're thrown into the furnace and all of a sudden they see a fourth figure. In theology, they call these theophanies where maybe we're getting a picture of God in the flesh before Jesus actually is born into the world. There's other places in scripture where this is believed to happen. Nebuchadnezzar sees the fourth figure and he notices that Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego are going unhurt. breath and not infinitely spared from every trial. Everywhere is always with us. Here's what's fascinating. God was always with them. But it's in the fire that he becomes most visible. I have found that true in my life. That it's often in the fire that God becomes the most visible to me. The nearest, the closest. Because the Bible said that God is near to the brokenhearted. Fear not, I am with you and I think the reason for that is because it's there that we're the most desperate for him we've got this tendency and I won't speak for you but I'll speak for me when life seems to be going smooth and easy I tend to be more lethargic I tend to be more self-reliant self-dependent maybe you can understand that but all of a sudden when I'm broken when my world's upside down I'm most desperate I'm most needy. And the great news for sufferers and sinners alike is that God is near to us. God is close. And that was a comfort to me as a young man. A young man who just read, God may not save my son, but he promises to be close. And I might choose to have my son 
But God says, what you need more than anything is me. It's me. If you have your son and don't have me, you have nothing. But if you have me and everything else is taken away, you have enough. And closing the gap between my agreeing with that and my loving that is hard work. But it's right. I want you to see another thing in this story. The fourth thing that the Lord showed me about suffering as a Christian is that we need others in the fire with us. We need community. You can't suffer in isolation or you will break. I want you to notice in this story, there's never one moment that Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego were ever listed by themselves. They found strength together. They went into the fire together. Let me ask you, do you have some Meshachs and Shadrachs and Abednegoes around you? See, that's what the church body is for. Church isn't for you to come check a box off on Sundays. Friends, when, when life collapses, do you have some people who can hold you up? Do you have some people in this community of faith that will be there to lock arms with you when you get the worst possible news you could ever imagine getting? Or when you're on your deathbed and your hour draws near, are there people surrounding you, praying for you, strengthening your family? I knew in this moment when I read this as a young man that we weren't going to be able to keep to ourselves and suffer in silence, suffer in the privacy of our home. We were going to need the church. We were going to need people, and we have. We've needed them all the way through. And my church has been so kind to our family in walking with us through the worst imaginable situation ever. You need the same. And fifth and last, notice it says in verse 26, then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the burning fiery furnace and he declared Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, servants of the most high God, come out and come here. Servants of the most high God. I, I laugh when I read that. Nebuchadnezzar finds God real quick in this story. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire and the satraps, the prefects, the governors, and the king's counselors gathered together and saw that the fire had not had any power over their bodies of these men. The hair of their heads was not singed, their cloaks were not harmed, and no smell of fire had come upon them. Here's the fifth and final point. God uses your fires to show himself to others. The satraps, the prefix, the governors, they're all watching this unfold. This is a crowded room watching this unfold and all of a sudden they all see the fourth figure and they see that these men are unharmed. They see the power of God in this situation and all of them are blown away. They're floored. God bears witness to himself through Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's willingness to suffer. They were not going to bow the knee. They were going to suffer willingly. And it's that suffering that showcased God's glory to the onlookers. Can I just encourage you? God will never bring suffering and sorrows into your life without purpose. There's no senseless suffering when our God is sovereign. But listen to me. One of the things he does, in addition to sanctifying you through your pain, making you be more dependent, making you seek him, is he uses your trial to showcase himself to others. It's as you walk through trusting God, clinging to God, that others look and say, I need that. Because everyone knows that at some point life is going to be hard. And when Christians showcase that God is enough, that he's faithful, that his grace sustains us. You are bearing witness in ways that you might not think you could ever do by sharing your faith evangelistically. You might be terrified of telling your neighbor about what you believe, 
You may be terrified of talking to your coworker about Jesus, but can I tell you something? The greatest way you can testify to the greatness of God, the goodness of God, the faithfulness of God is for you to suffer in public trusting him. And let others see that he is faithful to keep you, sustain you, and to hold you because he is. He is. Friends, I want to wrap up this morning. Thank you, Pastor, for letting me be here today. Austin, I appreciate the invitation to be here. Gang, here's my encouragement to you. You're going to experience trials and tribulations. In this life, Jesus says, there will be trouble. Some of you already know that. Some of you may be in it today. You need to know that God can deliver. But you need to have a place in your understanding that even if he doesn't, he doesn't owe you a, he doesn't owe you a healing. He doesn't owe you a smooth path. He doesn't owe you glassy seas. But will you serve him anyway? Will you recognize that he is near, he is present in your suffering? Will you lock arms with some others as you go through trials instead of isolating yourself? And will you allow God to use your pain as your greatest ministry? As a way for him to show himself to others. This is what Jesus says to us. It was read earlier. He says, come to me. All who are weary and heavy laden, come to me and I will give you rest. And friends, I can testify as a father with a broken heart. He will be with you. That even if you go through the worst thing you can imagine, he is faithful. He sustains. He gives rest when you don't have any power or strength to carry the load. Our Savior not only saves us from sins, he sustains us in sorrows. And so you come to Jesus today. If you don't know him, cry out to him today. He is not a Savior that's unable to sympathize with our weakness and our pains. If you do know him, So many mercies that you give and provide to us. Lord, I know in this room there may be those who are hurting and struggling. Lord, there are those who have been through pain and sorrow. There are those who have been rocked by bad news and their faith has wavered and waffled because they don't understand why. I pray that you'll use your word this morning to encourage, to ground us, to remind us of the truths. But Jesus, more than anything, I pray that you would comfort those who are hurting. Remind them of your nearness, that you are indeed in the fire. And I pray for those who have gone through suffering and are on the other side that they can testify to your goodness even in the midst of pain. We love you, Jesus. We could not endure the troubles of life without you. We need you. Everyone here needs you. I pray that they would seek you. In your name we pray these things. Amen. Amen. 
But friends, this morning has been an honor for me to be here with you. I'm going to be down front as the band closes. Pastor's going to be up front here as well. If you need to pray with someone, if you need to talk to someone, um, this is the opportunity to do that. Maybe you just want to come and kneel and pray. Ask the Lord to sustain you or sustain, sustain somebody you love who's going through the fire right now. This is an opportunity to do that. I would love to meet you after service. I'll be out at the table. Um, thank you so much for allowing me to come and minister to open God's word. Let's respond this morning as we sing and worship the one who's with us, the one who can deliver us, the one who's faithful in our lives in all circumstances. Let's stand together. Oh, my life, you have been so, so good. 
Then, Father, we thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you for that message, Lord, the message that we needed to hear at this moment, Lord, through the trials and um, times that we're going through right now, Lord, and with the hurt in the community, Lord, with the sickness, um, loss of life this past week, Lord. Um, thank you for bringing that message to us, Lord, that um, we hear it, we are, uh, adhere to it, Lord, and, Lord, that we do look up to you, Lord, and continue to strength, look for strength in you. Lord, just be with us this week. Forgive us for your failure. In Jesus' name, amen.